Thank you very much. That concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Figures this week by the Children's Reporter revealed that 254 children under the age of 16 were referred to them for carrying knives or other weapons last year. That's up 11%, so we know that it's a growing problem. Can I ask the First Minister, of those 254 incidents, do we know how many involve knives or other weapons being carried within school grounds? First Minister. Well, I don't have uh, those statistics uh, available to me today. If those statistics are available, if that breakdown is available, I will uh, certainly make it available to uh, Ruth Davidson and indeed to the wider chamber. We know, uh, and we know from some uh, extremely tragic uh, cases recently, uh, that there is uh, an issue, as I'm sure there is in many, many countries, of some young people, a minority of young people, carrying knives and other weapons in schools. And that is why it is important that through uh, the processes and procedures we have place, uh, in place in our schools, but also through our wider uh, justice system, uh, we take action uh, that combats that and makes sure that our schools are safe places to be, as they already are for the vast majority of young people across our country. Ruth First Minister, for that answer. Uh, in the aftermath of the tragic death of Aberdeen pupil Bailey Gwynne two years ago, new guidance was rightly issued uh, by the Scottish Government regarding the handling of weapons suspected or found within schools. And it says that education authorities, in consultation with key partners, should develop their own policy on weapons. Can I ask the First Minister what discussions have taken place between the Scottish Government and Scottish Councils since this guidance was issued? And can she also confirm that all councils have now developed and put in place such a policy? First Minister. Uh, there will be a range of discussions take place between the Scottish Government and uh, Councils. I, again, I am happy to give a, a full update uh, in writing to Ruth Davidson uh, about the, the current uh, state of uh, circumstances in respect of guidance. Ruth Davidson is right to talk uh, about the uh, report and the action taken after the report uh, following the tragic death of Bailey Gwynne. Uh, since the independent review into uh, that tragic death, we have been focused on implementing the two specific recommendations directed to the Scottish Government. Uh, members will recall that those recommendations uh, centred on uh, improving the resilience of schools to the threat posed by weapons uh, and to give consideration to amending the law in relation to searching pupils. And the second recommendation was about further legislative controls that can be brought to bear on the purchase of weapons online. Uh, ministers have considered the issue of violence and knife crimes in, in schools very carefully and have taken advice uh, from a wide range of stakeholders. These stakeholders don't support the introduction of a new search power uh, being introduced uh, for teachers uh, and indeed that was uh, rejected and opposed by the teaching profession. Those of course are the recommendations that were directed to the Scottish Government. Ruth Davidson is also rightly asking about uh, the recommendations for individual councils. It's important that councils have uh, the right processes in place and that all schools have the right policies in place and uh, through our officials in the Education uh, Department of the Scottish Government, we will continue to act to make sure that that is the case. Ruth Davison. I uh, thank the First Minister for that. Um, schools are also supposed to monitor and record every time that a child is searched, and specifically the guidance requi requires that any incident where a decision is made to undertake a search of a child or young person, or where a weapon is suspected or found, must be recorded. Can the First Minister confirm that every Scottish Council now operates such a policy, and that all instances of pupils being searched on suspicion of carrying a weapon or of weapons being found are now recorded locally, collated and publicly accessible. First Minister. Well, of course it is for councils to make sure that they are taking the action uh, that adheres to the guidance in all respects of that guidance. And let me say quite clearly today, uh, I would expect, and I know the Education Secretary expects councils to do exactly that, and that of course would include the aspects of the guidance that relate to both the monitoring and reporting of young people being searched or uh, young people being found to be carrying uh, knives or other weapons. Uh, but I, I should stress, of course, and uh, I'm sure Ruth Davison will understand at this point, that it is uh, fundamentally for councils to make sure that they are taking action to adhere to that guidance. Of course, uh, there is a responsibility on the part of the government and uh, we will always seek to discharge that responsibility to make sure we are uh, taking whatever action is necessary to ensure uh, that all the correct policies are in place and that guidance is being followed. Ruth Davison. Recognise what the First Minister is saying about the incumbency being on councils to follow the Scottish Government's uh, recommendations. But in fact, in a large number of cases, this information is not collated or in any way publicly accessible. 
Uh, in response to recent freedom of information requests, nearly half of Scottish councils were unable to confirm the number of weapons confiscated from pupils in their areas because the information was not held centrally. And that's information that I think that parents and the wider public should have a right to know. Uh, and the fact that it's not fully accessible means that we have no meaningful picture of the extent of this problem uh, in any area. So in the wake of Bailey's death, Aberdeen City Council has brought forward measures to ensure a clear picture of knife possession in schools and it's introduced an anti-knife crime policy. Does the First Minister agree that it's time that all councils met that same standard and will her government undertake to examine this matter again to ensure that all schools are the safe environment that parents have the right to expect? First Minister. Well, Ruth, Ruth Davidson has raised uh, an issue of concern and that she's right to do so and I certainly give an undertaking and commitment today to look further into the specific points that she's raised at today's sessions or session of First Minister's questions. Uh, certainly I uh, agree that we would want to see all councils uh, operating against best practice and Aberdeen uh, City Council for very tragic reasons of course has had uh, cause to look very uh, carefully and critically at the, the policies it has in place. Um, I, I should say that I, I don't, genuinely don't mean to say this in any uh, sort of hard political sense. We will frequently in this chamber be criticised for uh, seeking to overly direct councils and you know, members are across the chamber sometimes uh, accuse us of a, a, a centralising instinct in trying to do that. Obviously, uh, I don't accept that characterisation. So there is always a balance for us to strike between allowing local authorities uh, to discharge their responsibilities and it is the responsibility of local authorities here to make sure that guidance has been adhered to uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, making sure we're discharging our responsibilities as a government to make sure that happens. And I'm very, very acutely aware, particularly on issues like this, that parents uh, listening to this uh, will, will not be particularly concerned about whose responsibility it is. What parents will want to know is that their schools are as safe as possible for their young people. And that's a responsibility uh, that the Scottish Government takes very seriously. So I will uh, look further into, as will the Deputy First Minister, to the points that have been raised today to consider carefully whether there is further action that the Scottish Government requires uh, to take. Uh, of course, uh, in addition to the kinds of actions uh, that are the responsibility of councils, uh, the Scottish Government uh, also takes a, a range of different actions to try to reduce uh, knife crime, not just in our schools, uh, but uh, generally. Uh, that includes, for example, the No Knives Better Life Youth Engagement Programme, which has uh, received £3 million of funding since 2009 and it's perhaps uh, relevant to point out that 25 local authorities are, uh, as we speak, uh, involved in delivering that programme. We also invest heavily in the National Violence Reduction uh, Unit. So there's a, a range of actions to make sure that we are reducing uh, knife crime. We, we know that uh, for adults, the, the length of sentences for knife crime has increased uh, in recent years. Uh, but to go back to schools, I, I think every parent wants to know that when they send their child uh, to school uh, of a morning, then the school is as safe as possible for young people. That is the case for the vast majority uh, of young people uh, on the vast majority of days uh, in the year right across our country. But if we need to take action to make sure that that is the case for every single young person, then for councils and for government, it's our responsibility to do so. Question number two, Alec Rowley. <coughs> Thank you. Earlier this week, presiding officer, this parliament voted in favour of calling for a halt to the rollout of universal credit across the United Kingdom. The rollout so far is badly flawed and the six week delay will cause untold misery for tens of thousands of families up and down this country. This parliament now stands with most of Civic Scotland in calling for a halt to the rollout until the structural issues built into the system are resolved. Will the First Minister and her government now make the strongest possible representations on behalf of Parliament and the people of Scotland to stop the rollout of universal credit? First Minister. Uh, yes, we will. Indeed, we have uh, already been do doing that uh, and making an argument to the UK government that universal credit should not be further rolled out until it can have confidence and demonstrate to the public its confidence that that system works properly. I uh, recall uh, visiting Inverness during the recent election campaign and, and talking there uh, to uh, people who operate a food bank, <coughs> but also to people who are 
already recipients uh, of universal credit who told me about the delays and the, the impact and consequences of those delays, people getting into debt, people uh, running up significant rent arrears and huge misery, stress and anxiety being caused to some of uh, the people in our country who are already uh, in a very vulnerable situation. I think that is completely unacceptable uh, and I don't think any government in good conscience uh, should continue with the rollout of universal credit while those uh, concerns continue. So we will continue to make that case strongly to the UK government. Uh, of course, as well as the vote in the Chamber this week, this week also uh, saw coming into force some of the flexibilities around universal credit that this government has insisted on using new powers, uh, allowing for more frequent payments uh, and for housing uh, components to go direct to landlords. Uh, that is uh, perhaps a small way, but a significant way in which we can help to make sure that the most vulnerable are being properly cared for. But I have uh, significant concerns, uh, very serious concerns about universal credit and the misery it will cause. And I hope that we can join together to call on the UK government to do the right thing. Alec Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. And I think where this parliament can work together, this parliament should work together in the interests of the people of Scotland. This morning, we have learned from the Macmillan, Macmillan Cancer Support that the cuts to employment support allowance are affecting nearly 300 people living with cancer in Scotland. Let me be clear, these are cruel Tory cuts that make a mockery of Theresa May's claim and indeed Ruth Davison's claim that the Tories want to build a country that works for everyone. Labour will fight these cuts in Westminster, but can we protect people now? Reversing cuts for people living with cancer would cost £400,000. Reversing them for everyone affected by this would cost £14 million next year. Will the First Minister use the powers of this Parliament to reverse these cuts and support these people in their time of need? First Minister. As, as I think we have demonstrated by our actions, this government will act where we can to mitigate the worst impacts of uh, UK welfare cuts. Uh, since 2013, we have already invested more than £350 million to support low-income families who have been affected by the changes we've seen already. Uh, and of course, we know that the benefit cuts imposed by the UK government since 2010 uh, are expected to reduce welfare spending in Scotland by almost £4 billion uh, a year by the end of this decade. Uh, we will look uh, carefully at the case that Macmillan Cancer Support is making today. And of course, uh, as we, we heard just before First Minister's question started, the draft budget of the Scottish Government will be published in December and we'll consider this uh, in line with other decisions that we have to consider. It's important to point out though, and uh, I'm, I'm sure Alec Rowley is aware of this, that employment and support allowance is not one of the benefits that is being devolved to this Parliament. It will remain uh, a reserved benefit. And, and of course, it is one of the benefits that is to be rolled into universal credit. Uh, let me say just finally, we will mitigate where we can, but as I've said previously, and this is something I think all of us across this parliament really must appreciate, uh, when the UK government makes these cuts, these uh, wrong-headed, and in many respects, this one included, deeply immoral cuts, uh, they save money from doing that. They don't pass a portion of that saving on to the Scottish government. So any mitigation we put in place involves us taking money from other parts of the Scottish budget. Now, we will do that where we can, but I think everybody looking at this and looking at the scale of the cuts that I've just spoken about, £4 billion a year by the end of this decade, would know that the Scottish Government cannot mitigate every welfare cut that the UK Government makes. Of course, uh, if we had power over all of these benefits and all of the uh, money that supports these benefits, we could take very, very different decisions. And I hope one day Labour will join us in calling for the complete devolution of all welfare powers and responsibilities and budgets to this Parliament. Alec Rowley. The, the First Minister in her programme of government did announce that she was bringing forward a number of papers that would set the case for more powers for this Parliament and certainly the Labour Party look forward to these papers coming forward uh, where we can work together and where it makes sense to have powers in this place then that's where the powers should be. Can I also make clear that I understand the point that she makes about continually 
mitigating the, the welfare cuts that are coming for the Tories. And Labour's answer to that is that we want a general election as soon as possible. We have a government in Westminster that is bankrupt of ideas and no place to go. And we will, we will work for that general election and work to put Jeremy Corbyn into Downing Street. But can I say, can I say this? £400,000 from a government budget of £30 billion is not a lot to stop the Tory attack on cancer patients. But for those people and their families, it will certainly mean a lot. And I do hope that the First Minister will, will, will look at this. If the First Minister won't take action, then Labour will table amendments to the Social Security Bill in order to deliver this. Saying that we want a different type of social security system, one based on dignity and respect, is all well and good, but people do want to see action. Will the First Minister move beyond those warm words, work with Labour to reverse these cuts and to address the appalling welfare reforms that are affecting so many people so badly up and down Scotland? First Minister. Well, there's uh, were a few points uh, in Ali Rowley's uh, question. I think there was a question in there somewhere. Uh, firstly, in, in terms of his characterisation of the, the shambolic Tory government at Westminster, I absolutely agree. Watching the letters literally fall off the stage set yesterday was like watching an episode of Faulty Towers. Uh, it was so, so awful. But there is a serious point here. This is a shambolic, chaotic Tory Westminster government that is doing real damage day in and day out to people right across Scotland and right across the UK. And it's because of that, actually, that I continue to be so disappointed when I hear, uh, in, indeed, both of the, the candidates for the Labour leadership just now talking about how they would, in no circumstances ever, work with the SNP. In other words, Labour seems still to be in a position where they would actually prefer to see a continuation of a Tory government than ever work with the SNP. And I think that beggars belief and leaves people across this country utterly astonished. On the, finally, presiding officer, on the specific issue of mitigation of cuts, uh, yes, we will look at all ways in which we can mitigate Tory welfare cuts. I heard Alec Rowley say that Labour would put amendments down to the Social Security Bill. Can I make another suggestion? Uh, that Labour brings forward proposals in the budget process, because it's the budget process that sets out how we pay for all of these policies. So that uh, would be something that I think Labour should agree to do today. Uh, and the very final point I want to make is this. I, I welcome, if Alec Rowley has su suggested, as he seemed to do at the outset of his question, that Labour's position is changing on the devolution of welfare, I warmly welcome that. We will, as he said, uh, publish a, a paper setting out again the case for 100% devolution of welfare to this parliament. And when that comes, unlike the position Labour took in the Smiths Commission, I hope that we have Labour standing with the SNP Scottish Government uh, in favour of welfare powers lying with this parliament, not in the hands of a Tory government at Westminster. We've got a number of constituency supplementaries. The first from Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week, EME Furniture, based in Sankar in my constituency, has closed its doors after 50 years, resulting in significant local job losses. Only last year, they've been talking about millions of pounds of investment and doubling their workforce. The company blamed procurement issues with Scotland Exile for the decision. Can the First Minister therefore tell me what the Scottish Government are doing to ensure that Scotland's small and medium-sized enterprises can compete for public sector contracts and will she offer her reassurances to the workforce that all possible support will be given at what is a difficult time? First Minister. Well, firstly on the issue of procurement, the Scottish Government has over the past uh, few years made uh, a number of amendments and reforms to our system of procurement specifically designed to making it more streamlined, more transparent. Uh, and enabling it to help more small and medium sized enterprises across our country and we will continue to look for opportunities uh, to do that even further. Um, of course I was very disappointed to hear of the closure of EME furniture in Sankar. I know this will be an exceptionally difficult time for the affected staff, their families and indeed for the wider local area. Uh, Scottish Enterprise has already engaged with EME to explore all possible options for supporting the business to a 
try to avoid this outcome, uh, but unfortunately the company has now taken the decision to close the site. Uh, Scottish Enterprise will continue to engage with the company and are now working to identify any and all possible future opportunities for both the site and its workforce. And our Partnership Action for Continuing Employment team has also made contact with the company to offer assistance to the workers affected. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Is the First Minister aware of a recent Care Inspectorate report on services for older people in the Scottish borders, which among its many criticisms identifies delays in assessments compounded by delays in providing services? For example, I have one constituent admitted to the Borders General Hospital in February, not assessed till June, and still waiting for his care package even as I speak. By my calculation, that's eight months. Does the First Minister therefore share my concerns that admirable though the integration of health and social care is, it's actually not working in practice? First Minister. Uh, well, I am aware of the inspection report that Christine Graham refers to. I'm very disappointed uh, that it says that services uh, have fallen short of the high standards that patients have a right to expect. Uh, I'm also concerned at the leadership and governance issues identified uh, and the impact that they have had on patient care. Uh, I know the Health Secretary has already spoken to uh, both the Health Board and the leader of the Council about these issues and government officials are ensuring that Healthcare Improvement Scotland work with the Board to take all necessary improvement actions. I know that NHS Borders has already taken steps to improve leadership and governance, including learning from other NHS boards. Uh, Christine Graham, uh, in the course of her question, of course, uh, raised a specific constituency case. Uh, as I frequently say uh, in, in response to constituency cases, I don't have all of the details of that, but if she wishes to make them available to the Health Secretary, we'll make sure that that case is properly looked into. And Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister if the Scottish Government have done any research into the socio-economic impact in the southwest of Scotland region should the ferry companies operating out of the port of Cairn Ryan transfer their routes to Holyhead, as has been suggested could happen by the ferry operators if the chronic lack of investment in local infrastructure by the Scottish Government continues, mainly the need to dual the A75 and A77 artery routes north and south from the port. First Minister. Well, of course, it was this government that supported the development of the Cairn Ryan port, so we uh, recognise the importance uh, on the economy and uh, the social impact on the local area. We're also uh, investing in infrastructure, including, of course, the upgrading of the A77. So we will continue to take whatever actions are necessary to ensure that these important services stay uh, in Cairn Ryan to the benefit of people who live in that area. Question number three, Willie Rennie. Uh, the First Minister will have seen the shocking report of the way in which Gordon Edwards from West Lothian has been let down. Despite three referrals from his GP, Mr Edwards, who is only 17 years old, has been denied access to mental health services. Instead, he was sent to an employment service to get a job. How ill does he need to get before he gets the treatment that he needs? First Minister. Well, we expect our mental health services to provide appropriate treatment uh, to individuals who present to them, including uh, the individual that Willie Rennie has raised today. As Willie Rennie uh, knows, we accept the challenge that Scotland, in common with other countries, have to meet the rising demand for mental health services. But we are investing uh, additional resources into mental health services. We are seeing more people employed in our mental health services, uh, and we will continue to take the action that ensures that that uh, carries on being the case. In this year, for example, uh, this is the first time that NHS investment in mental health will exceed £1 billion. And across a whole range of ways, uh, we are taking action with health boards to improve services. Uh, I take the view and uh, took this view when I was health secretary that uh, as long as one person, uh, whether it's mental health services or any other uh, health services, feel as if they've been let down by the system, then government working with health boards and increasingly in the delivery of health care with local councils have a responsibility to continue to make improvements. And that's what we will continue to do in response to the kind of uh, case that Willie Rennie has highlighted today. Willie Rennie. The trouble is that Mr Edwards is not alone. In Lothian, two in five young people who need support are not getting it on time. In Grampian, it's 65% who've been failed. And these figures mask people who are being bumped off lists to meet waiting times targets. Advo advocacy group Kindred say young people have to be extremely ill before they get treated. 
Falkland House, well respected, say young people need early treatment instead of being sent somewhere else first. The First Minister agreed to commission an audit of rejected referrals for mental health. But that was over six months ago. What was the outcome of that review? And how much longer to young people like Mr Edwards have to wait? First Minister. Well, as uh, Willie Rennie said, uh, we did confirm a review of rejected uh, referrals and that that review would uh, get underway this year. Of course, there has to be preparation to, uh, to carry out that work, but we will take that work forward in the way that we have uh, committed to, and then we will share the findings of that with, with Parliament. As, as I have said, not just today, but on many previous occasions in this chamber, we are seeing growing demand for mental health services. That is something that we should uh, welcome because the of, of the fact that what lies behind that is a reducing stigma for mental health. Now, Willie Rennie and other members are right, absolutely right, to bring to this chamber uh, any case where services are not meeting the expected uh, level of uh, or quality of service that patients have a right to expect. Uh, but equally, I will continue to talk uh, rightly about the investment that we are committing to make sure that the improvements that everybody wants to see happen. Uh, I said earlier on that uh, investment this year will exceed uh, a billion uh, pounds uh, for the first time. But if you look at the, uh, the trend of spend over the last decade, in 2007, 651 uh, million pounds was spent on mental health. Uh, that, of course, is now uh, exceeding a billion pounds. Uh, we are investing more than 50 million pounds specifically to support reductions in waiting times, 10 million pounds supporting new ways of improving mental health in primary care, 15 million pounds supporting better access to CAMS and innovation around the delivery of those uh, services. So across a whole range of these issues, we're taking the action that people expect us to take to ensure that we see the improvement to services that people deserve and have the, the right to expect as well. Willie Rennie. C can I just be clear on what the First Minister has just said? She seems to be unaware whether the audit has been concluded. But has it actually started? First Minister. The, the work on the audit is underway. And when, when we have concluded the audit, uh, we will ensure that the findings of the audit uh, are shared with Parliament. Uh, like uh, the range of commitments that we made in our mental health strategy, uh, work is underway to deliver all of them and we will continue to ensure uh, that action is taken so that we meet those commitments and improve the services uh, in the way that people expect. Some more supplementaries. The first from Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The fracking ban has rightly been met with some celebration across Scotland. But there are concerns from communities and from many SNP members that the ban is not yet legally watertight, as it merely extends a temporary break on planning decisions. Will the First Minister get this ban properly over the line by putting it on the same footing as the ban on new nuclear power stations and commit to using the licensing powers when they arrive? First Minister. Well, of course, the, the ban on new nuclear energy in Scotland is also done through planning powers. That's exactly uh, what we are proposing with the ban on fracking. I mean, let me be clear. I, th I think to uh, some ears it will sound as if some members are dancing on the head of, of a pin here. Uh, fracking is being banned in Scotland. End of story. There will be no fracking in Scotland. I don't think that position could be any clearer. Now, in terms of the point about legislation, uh, members will also appreciate that because the, the powers over licensing haven't yet been transferred to this parliament, we don't even have the power to do what some Claudia Beamish uh, in particular is asking us to do in terms of legislation. But what Paul Wheelhouse outlined to this chamber earlier this week is the, a, an effective way of banning uh, fracking as the precedent of nuclear energy uh, demonstrates it is also the quickest way of banning fracking and I think those who like me do not believe that fracking should go ahead in Scotland instead of continuing to have this abstract argument should just welcome the fact that ba uh, fracking in Scotland is banned. Richard Lockhead. Is the First Minister aware that the annual Scottish survey 
just published shows that as a nation we are substantially overweight and adults are consuming less fruit and vegetables. And that report comes just before Obesity and Cancer Awareness Week starts on Monday. Given that this Parliament has tackled successfully smoking and is now tackling alcohol misuse, does the First Minister agree we now need to focus more on tackling Scotland's food culture, which, although improving, still sees Scots living in a nation blessed with an abundance of nutritious, healthy food, but with a very challenging health record? And does she agree that the forthcoming food bill has a big role to play and that we also need to tackle issues such as multi-buy deals in supermarkets, something I was reminded of when a few days ago I saw young people buying four donuts for his lunch? First Minister. Okay, I, I, I think I probably should uh, be careful not to single out the person uh, that, that Richard Lockhead refers to. There is a, a serious issue here. We actually uh, see rates of childhood obesity uh, declining. They've uh, declined from 17% in 2014 to return to the rate that was seen in 1998, which is 14%, but I think that is still too high. When I set out the programme for government uh, last month, I, I did say that I believe it's time for us to uh, show the same ambition as we have shown with alcohol misuse and smoking uh, to the growing public health challenge of obesity. That's why we have indicated that we'll bring forward a, a range of new measures to tackle obesity, including, for example, the uh, marketing of uh, limiting the marketing of foods high in fat, salt and sugar, as well as a range of uh, measures to, to help tackle obesity. Um, we need to continue to put across the messages around healthy eating. But of course, we also uh, have to continue to encourage young people to be more active as well. That's why things like the Daily Mile, the increase in PE provision in schools is so important. But Richard Lockhead is right uh, to identify this as a major public health challenge. And he's also uh, right to talk about the potential of the food bill uh, to help us make sure that we increase uh, healthy eating across our country. John Finney. First Minister, last week the Scottish Government announced it will not establish a specialist environmental court or tribunal. When the UK leaves the EU, we lose the oversight of the European Court of Justice, the ECG, which has played a key role in overseeing and enforcing environmental obligations. The legal system of the UK does not allow us to fully replace the ECG. First Minister, will you please outline what actions the Scottish Government intends taking to replace the vi environmental protections lost by Brexit, and will you reconsider your decision not to establish an environmental court? First Minister. Well, this government is determined uh, that the, in our view, wrong-headed decision to leave the European Union will not lead to any dilution or weakening of environmental protections or indeed employment protections or consumer protections or any of the other protections that people uh, feel are uh, so important. Now, uh, we will do that where we can through our devolved uh, responsibilities. Of course, this is one of the reasons why we're so concerned with the terms of the withdrawal bill right now, because uh, some of the powers that currently rest in Brussels uh, would end up been centralised at Westminster rather than coming here to allow us to take this action. So we will act uh, in whatever way we can and we will make the case where we don't have the power for the UK uh, government to do so as well. But there's no doubt that the weakening of regulation and protection is one of the things that I think people have uh, the right to be concerned about in the Brexit process. In terms of the issue about a specialist court, I mean, I recognise we have a, a difference uh, of opinion around that, but I think it's important, whether it's on environmental crime or, or, a, or regulation or any other matter, that we don't uh, somehow suggest that just because we don't have a specialist court, that these issues are not taken seriously within our wider uh, justice uh, and court system because they very uh, much are and will absolutely continue to be so. Question number four, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President. Officer, to ask the First Minister how the disclosure scheme for domestic abuse, Clare's Law, has worked during its two years in practice. First Minister. Uh, safeguarding those suffering from or at risk of domestic abuse is an absolute priority for the Scottish Government and we were pleased to support Police Scotland's decision to roll out a national disclosure scheme for domestic abuse. Uh, two years on, Clare's Law has assisted with over 2,000 requests and warned over 900 people of their partner's history of abusive behaviour. Uh, this scheme helps highlight the day-to-day -day work of Police Scotland officers in helping keep people safe and we will continue to work closely with criminal justice and third sector partners to reduce and ultimately eliminate domestic abuse. Stuart McMillan. I thank the First Minister for that reply, but does the First Minister agree with me that the disclosure scheme for domestic abuse in Scotland has successfully acted as a safeguard for individuals who may be a victim or at risk of domestic violence and that raising more awareness uh, of the scheme would actually go even further to protecting people in Scotland from abusive partners? First Minister. 
Uh, yes, I, I think that's an important point. When the scheme was first launched, uh, the government funded an awareness raising campaign. And given the benefits arising from the scheme already, we will certainly continue to work with Police Scotland, ensuring that anyone feels that they are at risk can take advantage of the scheme. Uh, last week, of course, the Chamber also unanimously supported the creation of a new offence of domestic abuse. Uh, we know that while reporting of abuse has increased, there are many, still many people uh, who suffer in silence. And that's why there will be a comprehensive publicity campaign for the new offence to ensure that people know that it will make it easier to hold domestic abusers to account, especially uh, for acts of coercive or controlling behaviour. Question number five, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will review the school inspection process. First Minister. As I'm sure Liz Smith is aware, earlier this week Education Scotland announced a significant increase in school inspections of over 30% in this uh, school year beginning in April 2018. As a result, the number of school inspections will rise from 180 to 250 schools per year initially. This will strengthen the role of inspection as a crucial tool to support improvement and is one of a range of improvement approaches announced by Education Scotland to enable them to reach every school every year through a variety of different channels. Liz Smith. Uh, First Minister, last November, Education Scotland could not actually confirm to MSPs on the Education Committee whether school inspection numbers had gone up or down. At the same meeting, they couldn't confirm how many full-time inspectors there were for 2017. And last week, it was revealed that key elements of historical school inspection data had been deleted. Will the First Minister accept that these are not the hallmarks which are required to inspire full trust in the administration of the school inspection process, and to that end, will she now agree with the Conservatives and all the other opposition parties that the HMIE inspection process should be fully independent of Education Scotland? First Minister. Well, of course, we uh, will we'll bring forward uh, legislation on... Uh, governance changes in education and, and these issues I'm sure will continue to be debated. The Education Secretary has set out his view on, on that. Uh, the, the issues are not, uh, are not identical, I, I know they're not, but I remember when I was Health Secretary facing a, a similar decision around uh, the role of, of health uh, inspectors and uh, absolutely those who inspect our hospitals, like those who inspect our schools, uh, are independent. Uh, but it's important that we also have a link between inspection and improvement. And that, I think, is, is the link that risks being lost if we go down the route that Liz Smith is proposing today. Inspection is not there for its own sake. It's there to identify any failings uh, or any areas where there needs to be improvement and then make sure that improvement is made. And it's why the statement that the uh, Deputy First Minister gave uh, earlier this week around uh, regional improvement collaboratives is such an important part of our reform agenda. So of course we will continue to debate these issues uh, in the chamber but I hope uh, whatever the uh, eventual outcome of that particular debate is everybody will welcome the announcement this week of the increase in inspections that I've just set out. Ian Gray. Thank you, President Officer. Indeed, the extra inspections announced by Education Scotland will be helpful in supporting schools work towards closing the attainment gap. The Scottish Government are only this week consulting on how they will measure that gap and progress. It is two years since the First Minister told us closing the gap was her top priority. Does she not think that two years to get round to thinking about what she means by the attainment gap is a little, well, lethargic, to put it kindly? First Minister. Uh, no, we've been getting on with putting in place the National Improvement Framework, introducing standardised assessments uh, that are now uh, across the country that will inform the teacher judgment uh, that we will then uh, publish in terms of the percentage of young people meeting uh, the required levels of curriculum for excellence. And that will be, uh, and is for the first time, uh, a comprehensive, very transparent uh, indication of how not just our education system is performing nationally, but how individual schools uh, and individual local authorities are performing as well. So that's the action we have already taken. But we've always said that there is not one single measure that should be necessarily used to measure attainment. That's why the consultation that was launched yesterday looks at a range of different measures to make sure that as we uh, continue to work to close the attainment gap, we're doing that in a way that respects and enhances the overall development of young people. That's what Curriculum for Excellence is all about. So uh, Ingray's characterisation is not for the first time not strictly accurate. We've been taking a, a series of steps to make sure not only that the, the money, for example, we're putting in through the Pupil Equity Fund is helping to close the attainment gap, but there are the measures 
uh, to record that and there is a transparency that means ministers and the wider system is completely accountable to Parliament and the public. Question number six, Polly McNeill. Thank you. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will undertake a national audit of the people, a number of people who are rough sleeping. First Minister. The programme for government set out our national objective to eradicate rough sleeping. We're backing that commitment with a uh, £50 million ending homelessness together fund. Uh, of course, we also established a short-term homelessness and rough sleeping action group, which is chaired by the chief executive of Homelessness Charity Crisis. That group, which actually meets today, uh, will make recommendations on what further actions need to be taken on rough sleeping, including, of course, any additional information or data that we need to gather. Paul McNeill. I do welcome the establishment of the Working Group on Homelessness. Would the First Minister recognise that rough sleeping is sadly on the rise and that it's likely that we face a further increase in rough sleeping through a bleak winter and that there is an urgency to act? I'm sure she agrees that it is not acceptable for anyone to be sleeping on the streets anywhere in Scotland. Shelter confirmed that the number of homeless applications where the applicant slept rough the night before making the application increased by 10% last year. In view of that, would the First Minister agree that it would be helpful to have a fresh assessment on the scale of the issue, albeit through the working group? Because there has not been an audit since 2003, according to Homeless Action Scotland. I would ask the First Minister, in a constructive manner, to consider that in going forward, that there should be a housing-led approach and not a hostel <coughs> led approach going forward and that in recognising the work of the charity sector and local government partners who are key to this does she agree that there is a case for the national rollout of the housing first model which I know that she's acknowledged in the past which recognises the multiple disadvantages that homeless people face establishing stability in their life I hope that she would agree that it can't okay, simply be left to the charity enough. sector but the government have to leave from the front thank you first minister well, the government is leading from the front, which is why we have uh, established the £50 million fund that I've, spoken, I've already spoken about and set up the expert group that meets uh, for the first time today. Some of these issues, I, I am actually, as I think Polly McNeill knows, very sympathetic to, but we set up an expert group to give us ordered uh, recommendations on the actions they think are most important for us to take forward. That may well include an audit, and uh, if, if that is the case, of course, we will carry that out. Uh, also, you know, there is, uh, I think, uh, a debate about what she characterised as the, the housing versus hostel uh, approach to this. And, and uh, we, again, the, there may well be recommendations come forward. One of the things I think is most important is that we don't just see this as an accommodation issue, whether that is houses, hostel. Often rough sleeping, uh, the, the way to tackle that is the package of support that needs to uh, go around people, which is why the, the housing first option uh, uh, model that she talks about, I think, is important. I've already said um, I think that does offer opportunities for individuals with more complex needs uh, to help stabilise their lives and prevent repeat uh, homelessness. But again, the reason we set up this expert group is to look at this to make sure that we're doing the right things. We do know that rough sleeping is increasing. I said that when I set out the programme for government. We also know, going back to uh, Alec Rowley's question, that that increase in rough sleeping and homelessness generally is very much being driven by the kind of welfare cuts that we've already spoken about. So unfortunately, we can't deal with all of this problem at source. Uh, I wish we could, but we can make sure we are doing as much as we can to deal with the consequences, and we'll continue to do exactly that. Question seven, Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the concerns of frontline nursing staff in Scotland, which have been highlighted in the RCN report, Safe and Effective Staffing, Nursing Against the Odds. First Minister. Well, the link between nurse staffing levels and high quality care for patients is well established. Staff welfare is a top priority, and we take staff's views on these issues very seriously. Uh, the RCN have called for safe staffing legislation and as we set out in the programme for government, uh, we intend to take that forward. Uh, of course, the UK government has given no commitment to similar legislation in England. In addition, we're committing an additional £40 million to create an estimated 2,600 extra training places over the next four years and we'll continue to work closely with the RCN and others to help shape future action. Miles Briggs. 
First Minister, in the last two weeks we've heard warnings from the Royal College of GPs that Scotland is now 856 GPs short and this week RCN Scotland predicting that Scotland is 2,800 nurses short. Obviously the 2,600 aren't going to cover that shortage, a situation which is now directly impacting on staff and patient care. Does the First Minister, having been in control of our NHS for ten and a half years, not now accept that the Scottish Government's NHS workforce planning has been totally mismanaged? First Minister. Uh, no, no, I don't. There are almost 12,000 more people working in our health service today compared uh, to the situation when this government uh, took office. We're also, as I said, in relation to nursing students, taking a range of actions, uh, including the safe staffing legislation that I spoke about, an increase in intakes to pre-registration nursing and midwifery programmes. Under the SNP government, there's been an average of 1,000 more nurses in training uh, every year compared to the previous administration and as I said uh, we are uh, spending £40 million on in increasing training places. We've also kept the nursing bursary which of course has been abolished uh, by the Tories south of the border. Something that is leading to a, a rapid reduction in the numbers coming into nurse training uh, in England. So we will continue to take uh, a range of actions in nursing and across other uh, elements of the NHS workforce. Uh, but I'll end where uh, I often do on questions about this because as we uh, take all of these actions to try to increase the number of people coming into the NHS and the different professional groups within the NHS, we face uh, the looming threat of Brexit, which is making it harder for those already here to stay here and contribute to our NHS and, of course, will make it harder for us to recruit those who want to come here. So, yet again, I say to the Tories, whether it's on this or welfare or any of these issues, shame on them for coming here to lecture others while their own government is doing so much damage to these things that we hold dear. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. Could I just ask all members just to remain seated for a second? Uh, I suspend this meeting until 2 p.m.